Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, guys, uh, this is a perfect video because after I wa Hi, guys, how's everyone doing? My name's Connor. Hello, sorry, rude. I was watching... I watched a Nalegia... Was it Nalegia? Crap. Okay, not a great start to the intro. I watched a video on the spread of the Roman Empire, and one of the things I asked in that video was... You know, I, I haven't really heard about or learned about any conflicts between Greece after Alexander and or of Greece between the death of Alexander and the incorporation of a lot of Greek territories into the Roman Empire. And uh, someone gave me this on Discord. Absolutely perfect. Thank you for that. Preemptive like. Let's go. Kings and generals. I'm going to have many questions, so get ready. The heroes and legends of the Iliad and the Odyssey inspired many great individuals throughout the ancient world, and these people played a great role in influencing history. Pyrrhus of Epirus was no exception. Pyrrhus. His adventures and conquests around Greece, Italy, and Sicily during the early Hellenistic age gained him a reputation for martial prowess which was unmatched in history. And uh, guys, it says here in the description, uh, the life of Pyrrhus of Epirus is remarkable. He, uh, he, he was born a few years after the death of his relative Alexander the Great and grew up during the wars of the Dia Diadochi. Learned war under Alexander's generals, lived through and fought many battles. We know him from his wars against the Romans and their legions. So, just again, I, I couldn't ask for a better video to answer my questions. And his benevolence to his people and soldiers ensured that he would be remembered fondly by his adversaries and friends alike, while his rashness would make him a lesson for others. Welcome to our four-part series on Pyrrhus, King of the Epirates. This video is sponsored by Imperator Rome, the newest historical grand strategy game from Paradox Interactive. Build a glorious empire out of blood and marble. Take the reins of power over any of hundreds of ancient nations, including Rome and Carthage, as you slowly expand to dominate the classical Mediterranean, Europe, and India. Expand trade, build roads, and command armies on the most detailed map ever made for a Paradox game. But keep an eye on your generals and governors. Some of them will increase their own power and you can you can fast forward guys if you war. want. Just click the right Enjoy arrow the a few times. The and majesty of the world of Caesar and Hannibal in Imperator Rome, coming April 25th. You can support our channel. I'm ready to learn the game. Get ready the in the description. Okay. In the aftermath of Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, his empire fragmented and was fought over by his generals. His mother, Olympias, whose grandson now sat Where's on the throne of Macedon, was threatened by the son of Antipater, Cassander. Olympias, being a Molossian, his mother, Olympias, whose grandson now sat on the throne of Macedon, so his nephew was threatened by the son of Antipater, Cassander. Olympias, being a Molossian herself, allied herself with King Aechides of Epirus and marched with him to reconquer Macedon. However, by 317 BC, she had lost popular support due to her ruthlessness, and Cassander now decided to take advantage. He pushed north and invaded Macedon, gaining victory and having Olympias killed. In this triumph, a part of the Epirate army had rebelled against Aechides and ousted him, declaring Neoptolemus II as king instead. Many of the deposed king's allies and family were killed, but his son, the three-year-old Prince Pyrrhus, was spirited away towards Megara on the eastern border of Epirus. His family had sympathizers in the town, but he was not safe from Cassander. Because of this, the prince's guardians fled north into Illyria, where they took refuge in the court of Glaucius, king of the Illyrians, who pitied the young prince and took him in. He also possibly did this for several practical reasons. Either because he decided a claimant to the Epirate throne was more valuable to him than Cassander's possibly empty promises, or because his wife was also a Molossian and convinced him to spare her kin. I think a lot of goodwill towards people is created because it's also beneficial to you. I, I know that's a kind of a negative 
view of how humans' minds work, but I, I think it's true, so no shocker. Not long after, Cassander invaded Illyria and defeated Pyrrhus's guardian in battle. He pledged to do no harm to the allies of Cassander in the region, but retained Pyrrhus at his court. In southern Greece, the forces of Antigonus I and Cassander were battling, which weakened the Macedonian king's control. The deposed Aeacides decided to take advantage of this weakness and marched back into Epirus, where he quickly gathered a large army. Cassander sent his brother Philip to deal with him, who quickly won two battles against and killed the Epirate king. Pyrrhus's father was dead, and the usurper Neoptolemus was back on the throne. After another round of fighting in Epirus and a peace between the Diadochi, Glaucius invaded Epirus in 307 BC, drove out Neoptolemus, and installed the 11 year old Pyrrhus as king, okay. whose kingdom was now essentially a client of the Illyrians. Six years later, Pyrrhus traveled north to attend the wedding of Glaucius's son, but the Molossians once again revolted and overthrew Pyrrhus. Guys, question. What happened to... Did, did the Persian territory that was... that was completely conquered by Alexander the Great's armies, did they also go back into a sort of central Persian-style leadership? Or... You know... How did that former Persian territory turn out when Alexander the Great died? I know a lot of his, you know, generals or, or you know, people under him took over certain areas, but did it eventually go back to a single entity pretty quickly? Paris. But the Molossians once again... Sassanids, maybe? ...to attend the wedding of Glaucius' son. But the Molossians once again revolted and overthrew Pyrrhus. Disgusted at his dependence on the Illyrians, they once again summoned Neoptolemus and placed him on the throne. Interesting. This time Glaucius could not help Pyrrhus, and he instead withdrew to southern Greece and the court of Demetrius Polyocrates, son of Antigonus I, who had married Pyrrhus's sister, Didymea. He then travelled with his new companion to Asia, where they rendezvoused with Antigonus. Under these two kings, Pyrrhus learned much in terms of generalship and siege warfare. Antigonus supposedly acknowledged his talents, stating that Pyrrhus would be the greatest general of his time if he lived long enough. This assertion would soon be tested for the first time. In 301 BC, the 80,000 strong forces of Lysimachus and Seleucus faced off against the 80,000 strong army of Antigonus and Demetrius at the Battle of Ipsus. At the age of 18, this was Pyrrhus's first experience of a major battle, and he would prove to be a competent fighter. As a young aristocrat, he likely fought in the cavalry alongside his brother-in-law Demetrius on the right flank. Sources do not give many details, but they say that though he was still a youth, he routed the enemy in front of him and was courageous in the melee. Nevertheless, the Antigonids lost the battle and Pyrrhus managed to escape with Demetrius to Greece. Pyrrhus was then tasked with commanding the remaining Antigonid allies in Greece, while his superior travelled to Thrace in order to make war with Lysimachus. In 298, Demetrius made peace with Ptolemy I, who had solidified his position as the ruler of Egypt. As a part of the peace terms, Pyrrhus was sent to Egypt as a hostage, which was more of a position as an honored guest than a prisoner in the ancient world. The new arrival impressed the court in Alexandria with his strength and prowess, both in hunting and during military exercises. His years in exile, both with the Illyrians and Demetrius, seem to have made him skillful at ingratiating himself with those he resided with. After a few months, Pyrrhus was permitted to marry, aka just a likable guy, with those he resided with. After a few months, Pyrrhus was permitted to marry Ptolemy's stepdaughter Antigone, tying him closer with the court in Egypt. In 297, Cassander died, and the Egyptian ruler provided Pyrrhus with soldiers and money so that he might reclaim his kingdom. He came to terms with Neoptolemus, and both decided to share royal power. Predictably, both kings... After fighting, or... Okay, but...
after some battle where he capitulated and they both are like, let's rule together or him just seeing the force that he had and being like, okay, let's just rule together or just uh, Hey, he's coming back. Let's rule together. Cause I feel like those are the only three options. And both decided to share Royal power. Predictably, both Kings immediately began plotting. After a conspiracy by Neoptolemus was uncovered, Pyrrhus invited him to dinner and assassinated his co-ruler, becoming the undisputed king of Epirus for decades to come. Like the other Hellenistic rulers, Pyrrhus would soon attempt to expand his kingdom at the expense of his neighbors, and he would use the Epirate army to do this. Thucydides describes the typical 5th century army of Epirus as a tribal levy, Disorganized, brave when things were going their way, but quick to dishearten and flee at any setback. However, it brave when things are going your way seems like an oxymoron. Going their way, but quick to dishearten and flee at any setback. However, it is clear that Epirus was influenced by the reforms in the Macedonian army to its east. Their infantry fought in the close order Sarissa Phalanx, and the cavalry fought with lances, similar to Alexander's companions. At the start of his reign, it is probable that this new modern army of Pyrrhus had a total of 20 to 25,000 troops, and was a match for almost any of his contemporaries. In the tumultuous struggle for the throne after the death of the former king, Pyrrhus was drawn into a civil war between Cassander's sons, the eldest Antipater and the youngest Alexander. Their mother, Thessalonike, favored Alexander and split the kingdom between them. However, Antipater was not satisfied with this and killed their mother. Caesar Isn't Thessalonike the name of an area within Greece? Was she named after that, or was the area named after her, I wonder? However, Antipater was not satisfied with this and killed their mother, seizing the whole of the country in 294 BC. In return for Stymphaea and Porauia in Macedon, and Ambracia, Acanania, and Amphilochia in Greece, Pyrrhus agreed to help Alexander. After securing these new territories with garrisons, he conquered the rest of Macedonia and handed it over to Alexander. Lysimachus, who had been petitioned by Antipater to help, advised the two kings to come to terms, and so they did, while Pyrrhus withdrew back to Epirus. This was not the end of it. Demetrius, who had been campaigning against the Spartans, now marched north and eventually murdered Alexander after a feast. Then he assembled the Macedonian army and proclaimed that he was the rightful claimant to the throne and that Cassander and his sons were the murderers of Alexander the Great's family. I've never seen Game of Thrones, or at least in depth. I used to watch it because I had friends who, who liked to watch it, and so I kind of saw some... But I know about something called the Red Wedding, where it was like a, a betrayal of, you know, you invite someone over thinking they're fine and then you kill them. And also the McDonald's, the, there's something that happened in Scotland that was similar, like people were invited over to stay only for them to, I, I guess it's a reverse because the people who were welcomed ended up murdering. It seems like luring someone who you want to kill into a false sense of security and over for a banquet or something is a pretty common way of killing people, your rivals. So I'd imagine enough times that, well, I have it in hindsight. Yeah. It seems like that's a common way of, of murdering your opponent. That Cassander and his sons were the murderers of Alexander the Great's family, whereas his own house had followed Alexander's legacy and attempted to keep it alive. This won the Macedonians over, and they acclaimed him the new king. By the end of 294... Wait, why is, uh... Constant... So, this city was called Byzantium... Before... Anything. Before Roman conquest, and then... Before it being renamed Constantinople, and obviously before renamed Istanbul. Interesting. BC claimed him the new king. Sorry. This won the Macedonians over, and they acclaimed him the new king. 
By the end of 294 BC, Demetrius controlled a powerful empire, consisting of the entirety of Greece, with the exceptions of Sparta, Messenia, and Pyrrhus's kingdom, with which he now shared a border. The former master and apprentice would be rivals for years to come. Meanwhile, Pyrrhus's wife Antigone died in childbirth, and he embarked on a series of political marriages which gained him the island of Corcyra. The Greek cities revolted against the Macedonian king. Are most childbirth fatalities on the mother's side due to blood loss? And because they didn't have a, a way of, like, blood transfusions that... And so it, it was almost always un, unfixable if, if the mother bled too much in delivering the baby? Twice. The Greek cities revolted against the Macedonian king twice in 293 BC. Encouraged by this, Pyrrhus invaded the western part of his neighbor's kingdom with around 30,000 troops and exacted tribute from a few cities. Responding almost immediately, Demetrius marched against Pyrrhus with a vastly superior army, and so he retreated into Epirus before the Macedonians could bring them to battle. Before leaving to besiege Thebes, Demetrius left an 11,000-strong garrison under his best general, Pantalcus. Smart. While he was back in Epirus, Pyrrhus's wife Lanassa, the daughter of Agathocles of Syracuse, deserted him and offered herself and Corcyra to Demetrius, stating that she could no longer bear sharing her home with Pyrrhus's other barbarian wives. Without any navy to oppose his former comrade, Pyrrhus sat back and allowed Demetrius to take both Corcyra and Lucas. This was just a prelude to his future plans. Being just as restless and ambitious as Pyrrhus, Demetrius now attacked Epirus's Aetolian allies in 289, neutralizing them and leaving Pantalcus to occupy them before marching into Epirus. He marched north through the mountain passes to invade Ambracia, while Pyrrhus, hearing of the invasion, quickly assembled a force to oppose Demetrius and marched south down the coastal road. However, as the two armies were now on different roads, they passed one another by. <laughs> While the unopposed invader now plundered the Epirate countryside, Pyrrhus encountered the 10,000-strong Macedonian force of Pantalcus, which had been left to garrison Aetolia. The army of Epirus likely numbered around 20,000 soldiers and heavily outnumbered their enemy. It is probable that, due to the veteran nature of the soldiers, Pantalcus's reputation as Demetrius's most competent commander, and the mountainous terrain of Aetolia, the battle was evenly matched despite Pyrrhus's numerical advantage. The Macedonians held firm despite the heavy fighting. During this melee, the two commanders sought one another out, and Pantalcus challenged the Epirot king to individual combat. Pyrrhus, not being one to yield to anyone in daring and prowess, accepted this challenge. After first throwing their spears at one another, the two combatants dueled with swords. Pyrrhus was wounded at first, but then quickly gave Pantalcus two wounds in return, one on the thigh and then the deciding wound to the neck. Demetrius's general was then carried away by his bodyguards, and being inspired by their commander's victory, the Epirot phalanx cut their enemy to pieces, killed many in the pursuit, and captured 5,000 prisoners. I was going to ask, like, if, it, depending on how that battle between the two leaders turns out, would they just surrender to them? That answers my when question. Pyrrhus promptly released. Phalanx cut their enemy to pieces. Being inspired by their commander's victory, the Epirot Phalanx cut their enemy to pieces, killed many in the pursuit, and captured 5,000 prisoners, whom Pyrrhus promptly released. Oh. This was Pyrrhus' first victory as a commander, and he had conducted himself in a brilliant manner, both in his generalship of the army and his personal courage in the duel. His army, jubilant with victory, now gave him the title Eagle, a moniker which would remain with Pyrrhus throughout his life and future conquests. The Epirot king, in an act of humility to his soldiers, stated, Through you, I am an eagle, for how should I not be when I have your arms to sustain me?
In addition, the defeated Macedonians now had a high opinion of Pyrrhus and his skill in arms, a fact that would play a part in the wars to come. And he let the, uh, the other guys go. Pyrrhus is just starting. Um, great video. Obviously, this didn't get into the actual fighting between Greek, Greece and, uh, you know, Greek kingdoms, Greek armies and Roman armies, but this is the precursor to that. Some good background knowledge for sure. So I look forward to watching the next few episodes. Love you guys. Hope you're all doing well. I'd appreciate any comments down below. I have a few more videos to get to before the day's over. Love y'all. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys again. Please, you guys are so awesome with the comments. Even in videos like this where I don't expect too many views, I still get a few that, that answer my questions. Thank you for that. See you guys next time. Bye.